Okay, so we'll go ahead and start. Again, welcome to um, our presentation tonight. My name is Kofi, I spell it K-O-F-F-I, um, but you know, most people say like the coffee you drink, which is okay. And if you do, I won't think less of you, I promise, uh, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, um, it is uh, Kofi, and I am the executive director of the Grand Traverse Conservation District uh, out in the Traverse City area. Uh, with me tonight, I have a crew uh, that is helping us um, get this thing running. Um, we have Parker Emil and uh, Lauren Sil Silver. They are um, MIP technicians, you know, at the Grand Traverse Conservation, Conservation District, and uh, you know, also very passionate about this um, endeavor. Uh, we also have Michelle Jacox, who is a food safety uh, specialist as well um, and covers several counties in the area. So those three have been um, tremendous in helping get this uh, event together and are going to help us tonight uh, navigate this as well. Um, in terms of panelists, you know, we have Tim uh, over here and Tim is what I would like to call a, a globe trotting soil scientist. Uh, because of the number of states he has worked in. Um, he has worked for the USDA and has also worked for the Department of Interior uh, over a span of 40 years. So if he has anything to do with soil, Tim knows a thing or two, a bit two about it. Uh, so he's with us tonight. Also with us tonight is Kama Ross. And Kama Ross is a forester for the Conservation Districts and she covers three counties um, mainly Benzie, Lilano, and Tra Grand Traverse. So, um, and then you have myself. So those are the folks that you have that are going to be um, leading the event tonight. And like I said, I really hope that uh, this is just the beginning because biochar has such tremendous potential. Um, and, you know, I have to let you know that this is not just an academic pursuit for us. You know, we also have empirical um, uh, point of view on this because we use it ourselves. Um, you know, Tim has been using it to grow uh, trees and, you know, other things in his own backyard. And I've been using it. Um, and some of the other participants have been using it as well. So what in the world is biochar? Really, to put it simply, biochar is what you get when you burn wood in an oxygen reduced environment. You know, so essentially when you burn wood, you have two stages. The first stage is char. And if you keep burning, you get to the second stage, which is ash, right? And if you wanna make char, obviously you don't wanna burn the wood and get to the ash portion. How or when to stop burning is a really critical thing. And we'll get the chance to talk about that a little bit, um, you know, tonight. But really, until um, you know you do a hands-on experience, you go through it with somebody. It's really hard to tell because it's not that portion of it, at least, is not exact science, All right? Um, so, as I said before. Um, burning wood in a controlled environment with less oxygen is going to give you the biochar as the diagram shows on the right. Uh, that process is also called pyrolysis and really all it means is, you know, burning um, wood. And it gets pretty hot, you know, it gets pretty hot. Um, but this is not a new thing. Biochar has been around for thousands and thousands of years. You know, so, so Tim, you know, give us a little bit of perspective on how long this thing has been around. Well, it's been carbon dated back to about 8,000 years ago. It, the story of biochar is really rich in, indeed. Um, in 1540 is the first recorded history and observation of the area when a 16 year old conquistador named Francisco de Oriana and a Dominican priest floated with 50 men down 
the Amazon, and they encountered lush fields of crops and colorful tribal cultures. And they were attacked by tall warrior women at one point, thus the name Amazon, which is out of Greek mythology for a, a fierce warrior women. Um, and if, if you get a chance to see the BBC documentary, The Secret of El Dorado, it's a very interesting story. Anyway, unfortunately, the explorers brought with them European diseases and the tribes were decimated after they passed through. We don't really know how they did this soil building, except that it's all the kitchen waste, bones, pottery, probably human ore, and char, char has been found as a key ingredient. It wasn't until the 1960s that a Dutch soil scientist went out there and sampled and, and wrote a PhD thesis and began our current modern interest in biochar. That's just amazing. It's fascinating. So, uh, Tim, again, you know, tell us what happens when you put this biochar in the soil. Well, first of all, fire is a natural component of the ecosystem. Um, we've known that for a long time, but not fires that burn after a hundred years of fire suppression, nor fires that have been accelerated by climate change. But burning wood in the low oxygen environment transforms cellulose, which is a complex organic molecule with lots of six carbon rings that compact into a honeycomb-like structure after the volatile organics are burned off. These honeycombs resist decomposition, are very stable, can be ingested, and they go right through livestock and earthworms. They also maintain the tubular features of the vascular plant and the porosity of the wood that is used as source material. Their highly porous nature, the highly porous nature of char offers homes for microbes. You might say workforce housing and the edge effects of the high surface area offer cation and ion exchange sites for nutrients. So all this works together to feed plants in the very small circumference around the feeder roots called the rhizosphere. Wow. The, the immediate zone that's highly active in, in a complex little world. If you've seen some of the movies on soil recently or fungi or tree communication, there's a lot going on in there. A higher microbial diversity helps reduce pathogens and increases disease resistance as well. And this stuff is just outstanding. This, you know, it's amazing. It never stops to amaze me. So now let's talk about Tim. Let's compare. Uh, so, you know, some people may be wondering, okay, you know, I already have compost. I use compost. You know, what's the compost? What's the difference between compost and biochar? About a thousand years. <laughs> um, <laughs> compost <laughs> is, is actively, uh, it's called active carbon. It's readily decomposed, whereas the char is very stable and does not generally decompose any further, at least as we know for thousands of years. Um, yeah, because I was talking to a farmer um, on the uh, Lilano Peninsula the other day and he grows vegetable. And he said every year he has to apply compost. Now, if you are using biochar, he wouldn't have to do that, right? Yeah, it would definitely um, mellow out and, and become a more um, diversified living system. Good, good. Okay, so now why biochar still? Um, yeah, go ahead, Tim. There's an abundance of materials here that would be readily converted into char. And it's currently 
burned off into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And as we'll see in some slides in, in a few minutes, um, it has a great potential to increase productivity and, and build soil. All right. Okay. And now talk to us about some of the benefits. <laughs> there are a lot of them, it seems like. Oh, yeah. It, there's a lot going on, to, and it's more than we can cover in this half hour. Um, but let, let's say um, the system is intelligent beyond our old assumptions. Um, soil biology is going to be the key to our future. And um, soil health is something we need to be paying attention to for nutrient density and taste, terroir. Um, there's a lot of other applications that are in development, like remediation of hazardous materials and cleaning up of groundwater. So we've only begun to tap into the potential of this stuff. Right, right. Okay, so these are some of the ways it is used, right, Tim? Now, Paul, uh, can you address the carbon sequestration I used a little bit? I think, you know, we um, get to the minute, but that's, you know, the part I'm really interested in too. Well, uh, a soil scientist that recently won the Nobel Prize, um, Ratan Lau out of Ohio State University, it shows graphs and his, his calculations show that our potential drawdown, just changing our land management practices and using things like biochar could be as much as 50 parts per million taken out of the atmosphere and put back into the ground. Wow. 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 OK, now how about a soil amendment? I think you There's mentioned you mentioned well, something earlier about how it changes the structure of the soil. Yeah. You know, I like to say whatever we're doing right now that works can still be continued, but adding biochar will enhance the whole system and increase aggregate stability and availability of nutrients, especially in these sandy soils out here in Michigan. It increases the water holding capacity and the nutrient holding capacity. Okay. So, so basically, you know, from what you're saying is um, the carbon sequestration ability um, can be can affect the how this can be used to regenerate what we do in agriculture or practice regenerative agriculture. It definitely has a role in regenerative agriculture. Yeah. Okay. Now, so if let's say, you know, I don't have a, a hundred acre farm, I just want to plant some tomatoes, you know, for my lovely wife and some roses for my grandma. Can I use biochar for that? Yeah, biochar could be easily made in the backyard in, in a container and it can be mixed with compost and added to your garden and added in increments of say 10% to the compost. Um, and add it over year to year, you'd be building up your carbon long term and the soil microbial diversity. Nice, nice, nice. So let's talk about uh, the various ways biochar is made. Um, it can be made very simply. And there are also some very, very complex systems. Uh, Tim, you want to Talk about some of the systems. Well, um, the kilns are can be very expensive. Cornell has one that's about a million dollars, and it measures everything going in and everything going out. Um, 
probably a, a lot of the more primitive systems are just burning it in the ground. We've come to know this flame cap kiln here in Benzie and Leelanau counties. It's, they're easily made, um, very inexpensive, and they do a good job. You can see on the, the two flame pictures there, there's not a lot of smoke produced. So, um, and then they, the slide, the picture on the right there shows the product. It's beautiful black char. Yeah. So, so Tim, talk to us about the flames, you know, so I look at the flames here and there are no, there's no smoke. Talk to us about that. That's what the um, air comes in from the side and, and goes up. That causes the oxygen dep deprivation inside. And it, essentially what it's doing there is burning everything, burning the smoke so that there's no emissions or low emissions coming out of there. OK, and so, so when you're making biochar, if you see a lot of smoke, that's not good. Yeah, you've either been using wet wood or green wood, and um, that'd be one of the prepara preparations would be to make sure everything is dry and of similar size so it, it does a complete burn. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. And some, so some of the units that um, the complex units that we're talking about, for example, the ones at the bottom of the screen here, you know, those are very complex. And I was talking to a manufacturer just this morning, the one in the middle here, the carbonator 400, he said that's half a million dollars, you know, but it's a mobile unit that can be uh, moved from site to site, you know, which makes it really appealing, but it's a very efficient, um, you know, system, but not cheap. You know, which is part of the reason why you know char is you know not in the mainstream yet, but there are ways to get around it, um, you know, by designing some things that are not as expensive. But that's a uh, you know something that we need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to be, bring a uh, Kama into the conversation. Kama. Uh, as a forester, you know, I want, I, want to, I want your voice in this too. So how do you think forest landowners can benefit from using biochar on their properties? Yes, well, you know, I've been a forester um, up in this area for quite some time. And as I do site visits to visit and give recommendations for people to be the most active steward of their property, you know, the majority of the people are concerned about climate change and what can they do to mitigate the effects that they are witnessing on their land. And I think on our sandy soils, like um, Tim and Kofi have said, you know, one of the biggest challenges I see is trying to maintain moisture and get the nutrients to the to new plantings and any kind of crop that we're growing, whether it's our orchards and vineyards or your back garden or trees and shrubs. Um, and the conservation districts who I work for, the um, three conservation districts have been selling bare root seedlings for decades. And um, we do a good job of it, but we really struggle with seedling survival. And what I'm really finding for myself and for people that I've encouraged to use compost biochar mix is that the success rate of our, our, our efforts to plant trees and shrubs and whatever in the ground is so hot, much higher. And the growth rate of the trees and shrubs and plants are just, they're healthier. So, you know, when you want to do something positive in your backyard, using a compost um, biochar mix in everything that you do is regenerative, regenerative and you're building up the soil and you're going to see much greater success. And I'm, I'm at the point in my life where I want to see people having um, good success with um, the effort that they put forward and uh, on their stewardship of their land. The other thing that um, as a forester, you know, we're doing a lot of um, management of forest land and it's really hard. A lot of people have downed ash trees. Um, they have beech 
coming down. So they have a lot of biomass in their own woods. And, you know, some people can, a lot of people can burn it for firewood to heat their homes, but not everybody. And some people have way more than they need. So I really think that bio, the biomass that we have in our woods because of the non-native insects and disease and the stressors of climate change might lead us to try to return some of that, not just let it sit on the forest floor, but let's return it down into the soil and really store it long term as we build up our, our soil. So that's kind of the way when I talk to landowners on my site visits, um, that's what I kind of like to share. And I would say the majority of them think it sounds like a pretty smart idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that sounds good. That sounds good. I like it. I like it. Um, now, how about uh, tree services? How can local tree services or companies be part of the local industry? Well, you know what? They already are. Um, there are many tree services in our area that um, are taking care of all these trees that are, you know, are coming down or they need a lot of prune and they just need a lot of work because we just have so much going on. Um, and what do they do with that? You know, they chip it, they haul it to a site, they store it, they, you know, bring it to the landfill, you know, but um, why not? Why not turn a negative, like all this stress and environmental degradation of our woods and turn it into something positive. So some of the some of the tree services are hauling wood to a biochar producer. Um, some people are actually purchasing biochar from a larger downstate um, company and using it on their uh, new installations when they work with landowners. So. I think the tree service uh, community is would be well would welcome a way to utilize this wood instead of hauling it in their trucks down the road to a storage and and so um, I think we're ripe. We have between our orchardists and vineyards having uh, multiple prunings that have to um, be burned. Let's let's turn that into char, not into ash, and let's burn it on the property that it was generated on and return it to the soil. Keep it real local. I, I'm really passionate about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and can I, you know, I, I think you said something the other day too that, um, you know, really resonated with me is, you know, somebody asked, where can I buy biochar now? And you can get it from Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but we're in Michigan, please. <laughs> Shop local. Get it from Amazon. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so thank you. Uh, one more question for you, Kenna. What do you think is the biggest challenge uh, for using tree residue or tree slash uh, for biochar? Yeah, yeah, I think the most important thing that we uh, we face as a forest industry is um, trying to transport from the site, the forest, wherever the biomass is, the tree residue is, to a mill. You know, we can take it down to Packaging Corporation in Manistee and make it into cardboard. We can take it to Grayling and make it into particle board. We can take it to Cadillac Renewable Energy and produce um, electricity. But that's transportation and that costs a lot when the product is such has such low value. So, you know, I think um, trying to figure out how to bring a unit that uh, works um, at a scale that's appropriate for our area right to uh, a central location or onto each individual property is is going to be a real trick. So collaboration with the private industry, other conservation organizations, and the private sector has got to work to make this happen. But um, yeah, we don't want to burn more fossil fuels to uh, you know be our solution to to climate change. So yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Cameron. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, it's a uh, really interesting um you know because i so, so my, my mother-in-law loves roses so if i have a, a a a small pot of roses i can put biochar in there and win her over <laughs> definitely <laughs> all right so um my uh Slide doesn't want to move now, but um, you know, Tim. Tim, let's uh, let's let's talk about um, you know, let's go back to the Amazon for a second and, and talk about the the difference. You know, do a comparison between 
the soils in Michigan here and the soil tap in the Amazon basin. The similarities are that we have a low fertility and low, relatively low organic matter. Our differences are that the soils in the Amazon are clayey and the soils here are sandy, but both being forested, once you remove that tree and the, the tree canopy and the duff layer, you've exposed a mineral soil that's really not ready for agriculture. Um, and it could use everything that biochar has to offer and compost. So the, the, one of the things to keep in mind with biochar is that it has a liming effect. So it's good to have a soil test and kind of monitor your pH and add it incrementally. Okay, so talk to us yeah. about this slide, Tim. Okay, that's a model that I developed. The um, two profiles on top speak volumes. Um, that shows the local Amazon soil that that's naturally under the forest and then the terra preta that's been man-made and that's up to a meter deep and um but we had a fellow talking the other day his soil organic matter here in michigan is less than one percent well that terra preta soil is up pushing 18 percent organic matter but three or three to five percent is doable so the next set of four profiles is just a potential model that we can begin to build our agricultural soils here like the soils of the Great Plains are. If we, we go directly west on the 45th parallel, we have profiles like the Terra Preta on the right or this, um, all four of these actually, um, but the Great Plains are primarily the, the three profiles on the right. Um, up to a meter deep of topsoil. All right, all right. Yeah, that, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. Now, how about the graph on the right? The graph on the right is one of the gems of um, science from the last hundred years. It's the USDA textural triangle, and it shows the characterization and the classification of uh, the three particulates in any mineral soil, sand, silt, and clay. And those delineations up there can be readily identified in the field. And they all have particular applications, like the clay would be useful for holding water, but it's, it's not very good for um, irrigation. Uh, silt um, is a high water holding particle. The clay is a high nutrient holding um, particle and the sand in the lower left hand corner there that's the kinds of soil that we have here in Northwest Michigan so by adding char we're adding the the parts of the soil model that are missing. Um, very neat very neat. Okay and, and this one this this is a a cation exchange capacity is essentially a, a soil test we've been doing for many years that shows nutrient holding capacity. And here again, our, our sandy soils on the right, very low in cation exchange capacity. But if we're adding organic matter and biochar, you can see on the far left, orders of magnitude greater. And that's why this stuff is often called black gold. So, so, so biochar is actually called black gold. In places, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. I like that. Very neat. Okay. So um, this is the end of the presentation portion of uh, the evening. Uh, on this slide here, you know, we have some resources for you. Um, you know, if you like to, to dive deeper um, into this. And also, let me say this before I forget. This is not, this is just the first session we're holding. So next month, 
we are thinking about holding another ses a session and maybe the following month and you know we'll let you know when those are but this is just the beginning we just wanted to give you a taste of a wide range of what biochar is and what it can do and what it can be used for so these are resources that you can use and i want to draw attention to the local resources here toward the bottom um, the biochar guys website is um, a group of two people and tim is part of that group um, you know he lives in northport so you know very local uh, you have Tim's information here if you want to reach him directly the cross composting is a, a gentleman who has uh, a composting company in uh, what's the town again? Uh, Maple City. Maple City, right? And he sells uh, compost. It's called Millennium Compost. So it's compost mixed with char, right? He also sells regular compost. So when you go, you have to specify that you want the one mixed with char. But he's selling that right now. Um, I am here with my number and my email, you know, if you have questions for me, uh, be happy to, um, you know, answer. The last person here, Paul May, is another gentleman in Frankfurt who makes biochar and sells it, right? So you have two sources right here locally, you know, that you can source biochar from, um, you know, if you don't want to make it. Um, before we get to the Q&A portion, you know, I want to say something. Um, safety. Burning wood has, you know, especially in this system, because it gets so hot and the flames are so powerful, can get out of hand very, very quickly. So unless you have somebody who's shown you how to do it or you know what you're doing, please don't just go and try to do it by yourself. Once we are able to get groups together outdoors, we are planning on holding some demonstrations in the area so people can come and see and learn how to do this. It's pretty fun to do with a group of people. You know, so please be safety minded, never do it without a source of water ready in case you need to extinguish the fire or put it out. So when we do it, we always have a source of water handy, ready, and we monitor the flames and the fire really, really closely, you know, so really important. So we have come to the Q&A portion of the evening. So if we have any questions, let's have them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to start, we had a question from Sarah that wanted to learn more about how to make biochar. Tim, you want to take that? <clears throat> Particularly on the orchard level. Orchard level. Um, <clears throat> that's, yet there are some things to be figured out there. Are, you know, a lot of, you see that the orchards that pile up trees or uh, brush that, that were clippings from the trees and then they just burn it up. Um, we yet to have, developed a big big enough kiln to handle that kind of material um, but it could be done it could be done in an open burn it's just a lot more work and then you need water on the site to douse it at the right time but if if she has an orchard with material that's ready to make char we we like to talk and take a shot at it and actually we're in a, dis in a discussion with a vineyard manager right now who's trying to uh, make some char on his property you know he has some stuff ready to go um so yes option other questions yeah tim we had a question uh, what's the difference between biochar charcoal and potash Biochar and charcoal are very much the same thing. Um, biochar obviously being prepared for agriculture and the biological component is, it, it means it's inoculated for agriculture. Charcoal, both of them would burn at a high temperature. 
very similar. Potash is actually mined and it's a source of potassium. And I understand one of the biogeneration plants near Cadillac will sell you a whole semi load of ash that has some potassium and other nutrients in it um, for like 350 bucks, but it's, it's really low nutrient value. Okay, okay, next. Yeah, so Lara had a question and she said, given that other solutions are effective um, in greenhouse gas reductions, why is this a focus? Tim? This is a, a more natural um, solution. I mean, there's a lot of talk about geoengineering. It's essentially making more machines that are already, you know, to clean up what all our current machines have you know, polluted the, the atmosphere with. Um, certainly other kinds of land management that target carbon and increase in carbon are also very good ways to, to handle carbon sequestration. Kama might have something to say there. Um. I just think it's it's something that we can do and we can um, utilize our local material for. So um, it's just, it's it seems like a solution that's just dangling just a few feet ahead of us and we can't quite grab it and figure it out, but it's right there. So let's yeah. use it. Yeah. Okay, we've got questions about uh, the actual size and structure of the materials used to make biochar. Uh, so we had some questions regarding um, wood chips, if you could use uh, like a, uh, a wood chipper you'd see um, an arborist using uh, versus large diameter trees. Can you, what's the difference in, in making biochar with those different size materials? The easiest material to work with is less than three inches in diameter. I, again, the, the more well sorted it is and um, the, the easier the burn and with a little practice you can make it all work um, we, we don't have any techniques we haven't burned to the people that I've worked with the larger stuff than three inches in diameter wood chips is perfect for an auger feed continuous system but there again we're talking upwards of 75,000 for a unit that'll do that Um, so we had another question from Marshall, uh, kind of wondering, so he's a home gardener and has started making some biochar and we probably have some other folks um, doing the same. Uh, and he's wondering how much should be in the soil as in the percentage and how deep it should be. Uh, he says that he targets the root zo zone at this point and burns pine slash for the char and then charge it with compost tea before putting it into the soil. Um, I'll add, or he's got a second part to the question, but I'll let you answer that first. Recommendations I've seen and heard are quarter to a half inch of char on the on the surface mixed in to six inches. I I would like to encourage people here to look a little bit deeper because if you start to make a deeper profile, you're again increasing your productivity by leaps and bounds similar to a Great Plains mollusol or a soil. Um, sounds like he's got, got a good thing in progress. The, just the, the only thing to watch is the liming effect again. So uh, the second part of his question is how long do the microbes, microbes stay viable in the char outside the soil? Um, uh -huh. Specifically, they're on Kalkaska sand. Yeah, that's microbes require a lot of the same thing that plants do: constant moisture, um, decent temperature. Um, the tea, the the compost tea, is viable only for a short period of time, like a matter of hours. So, um, 
obviously timing is key. Can I add too that, um, you know, we do really encourage people to do active um, soil testing. And, you know, that's available through your Michigan State University uh, Extension Office or, you know, down in Traverse City. But, you know, if, if you're going to be adding char and compost, you really should be monitoring what that's doing and, and um, get some scientific uh, data on the quality of that soil and, and how you're changing it. That would be really helpful as we mm -hmm. move forward. Mm -hmm. Just had a quick follow up to that. Um, Marshall Hanna uh, said that he uses a farm tractor T drive over char to crush the char into smaller pieces, um, then uses a half inch screen to get the larger sizes sorted out. Also sand needs all the help. It can get to help hold nutrients in the root zone. Compost is great, but it leaves the soil fast. Mm. That's a great comment. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tim, how about uh, using biochar if you have really um, high clay soils? Um, the gentleman was asking. Um, I would encourage him to connect with me and let me know where he, he is located. So we, we could look at the soil profiles in the area and I can give him a better answer, but it, it should enhance clays as well. Hey, Tim, to go off that, maybe um, could you talk about uh, like aggregation a little bit more and aggregates in the soil? Um, it all takes time. And, and what you're doing is adding ingredients that will work together over time. This isn't, it, it's a different concept than just adding NPK from a bag and expecting a 10% yield increase or something that first year. Um, and it's site and soil dependent as well. Would you say that with like a clay soil um, that it could help break that up to um, not have as much standing water per se, increase water permeability, et cetera? Certainly. Again, um, depending on where he is in the state and what kind of soil he's got, I ask him to contact me and I can generate a soil map and see what kind of soil processes are in the area, what the parent materials are. and um, we, we can give him some tips Great. and work with him on it. So we've got a lot of questions regarding um, folks wanting to make biochar in kind of that rudimentary way with the open pit, um, mm -hmm. you know, in their backyard mm -hmm. or on their property. Um, so can you give some tips and like maybe the depth and the structure of that pit that you want and okay. maybe like the materials you're putting in for that? Uh -huh. Uh, six to 18 inches deep is, is fine. And um, just keep adding material on top. I like to do two burns. The first one I'll mix down, I'll mix down into the subsoil. And then the second burn, I'll mix with the compost and make the topsoil. So I have a, a deeper profile than just six or seven inches. Do remember that if you're burning though, not in a container, you need to get a, a burn permit from the your township or the DNR that can be found online, um, looking at burn permits. Uh, it's advisable if you can wait until there's snow on the ground, that would be a lot safer. Um, and then you also need water to douse the fire. So um, there's quite a bit of setup to get yourself ready to do a burn properly. Good point. Tim, can you touch on how biochar affects the pH in the soil? The <clears throat> biochar that we've made from the local woods here has been about a pH of eight. And so um, compost is probably in the area of seven, seven and a half. So again, just kind of be conscious of what you're mixing and if you can get a pH meter or run, run, get some pH tests run occasionally the, the natural soil development processes here are tending towards acid development. So if you're at it incrementally over the years, um, it shouldn't be a problem. Can you use biochar um, as a way to adjust the pH in your soil to make nutrients more bioavailable? Yeah, if you have 
a moderately so what would be called say an acid soil um, you you can increase that pH you want to have it around 6.8 to 7 in the top soil that's the best nutrient availability Tim, we've got another question about um, using animal waste. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible to make biochar um, from uh, animal waste? It, like, let's say you had a large uh, dairy operation or a feed lot where you have a lot of uh, manure built up. Is that uh -huh. something that can be charred? It is. They, they're actually doing a lot of biochar with um, chicken manure. To me, it, that's a waste of the microbes in that material. I, I think. It, I would make biochar out of wood and add the manure with it. Then we had a couple of other questions um, about um, mobile uh, pyrolysis units. Um, are there those types of things that would be large enough to handle some of uh, the bigger materials on site at our orchards? Um, one individual said that uh, they had seen some that are man manufactured in China. China, are there any US manufacturers? Yeah, there's an outfit called Air Burners and they're in Florida. And I think Kofi found somebody here locally that within an hour's distance from Traverse City that's involved with the company. Um, they have a small trench burner. It's around 35 to $40,000. It pulls behind a truck and I think that would be very usable here for, for orchards. And then you would just dig a trench with a backhoe and, and burn the material in the trench, just a little bit bigger scale than we've been talking about. That, that was the carbonator 400 you had there, Kofi? Yeah. yeah. That's running up, we're closer to $100,000. But that's a closed unit, right, Tim? Yeah, it's got a. It's actually got a conveyor belt in the bottom that'll move the char out as it's burning. So, um, Forest Service has been doing work with those. Tim, is there currently? We've had a couple of questions uh, regarding this. Uh, some from private property owners, and some from the perspective of uh, tree tree servicers. Um, is there any place right now in northern Michigan folks can can take their down biomass to have biochar made offsite? <laughs> that's that's a good question. A question. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I'm currently accepting as much as I can right now. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I think Paul May would be open to getting some. He he's also got a tree service guy that delivers material to him or he has to go get it some of it um, but he, these these are kinds of things that if we begin a network we we can see who has what to offer and and begin to do a collaboration uh, so Tim you will accept some and we know Paul will accept some too at this I point think so yeah yeah, so, you know, just make sure you take the uh, contact information at the end of the slides and you can contact these too. And as we do all this, we do need to remember that the transportation, the burning of fossil fuels, you know, moving material around, yeah. you know, we really don't want to uh, start, you know, I mean, that's not really the solution to the problem. So mm -hmm. um, hold tight. And I think we're getting closer all the time to yep. finding a unit that makes sense to be brought to the to the material. But I'm not sure. Good point, Tamara. Mm -hmm. So we've got another question here. Um, what about uh, academic institutions um, mm -hmm. being a sustainable partner and long-term solution to improving biochar production? Uh, currently, do we have any um, you know, maybe MSU Extension working on this, uh, maybe Eagle. Are there any um, academic institutions that are working on um, advancing this in our region or That's willing to partner? Excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, MSU has been doing some studies, one greenhouse study that I know, um, and some field trials in the Lansing um, 
experimental farm. They didn't publish that data. The universities are very uh, cautious right now because there are too many unanswered questions. And you can see that, you know, it takes money to do this scientific work and the money is not currently flowing toward biochar, <laughs> but there are some 140 institutions worldwide that are um, working on studying. And four of our ARS farms, um, Agricultural Research Service are being used. They're, they're, the e European Union is funding trial plots on our ground here um, and the Minnesota, University of Minnesota and ARS. There's a fellow there that's doing a lot of work along with that. Do you have anything to add, Kama? No, but I just know that uh, so much has happened on the coasts. Oregon is um, yeah. Yeah. way ahead of where we're at. And uh, I think the universities and the Forest Service and the private sector, you know, have all gotten together and um, they're really doing some very innovative work out there. They also have the effects of the Western wildfires, the Pine Mountain Beetle and climate change that's making their maybe their work a little bit more um, immediate and, and but pushing them along. But um, I, yeah, it, we do have examples in the States, but we look to Europe um, and China, lots going on with biochar. We gotta, mm -hmm. we gotta keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. So Tim, we had a couple questions about nutrient availability and um, if biochar can help with nitrogen in the soil, as well as um, how is biochar diff are and um, activated carbon different? Um, <clears throat> the future seems to be headed toward what they're calling designer biochar, which would be crop specific and perhaps even nutrient specific. My sense of the thing is there's some 30 elements that are you know comprised of macronutrients and micronutrients and if you begin to try to feed the plant all of those in the right proportions um, you're taking on a lot and I like to say let the microbes do the work feed the microbes increase the diversity of the microbes increase the, the soil carbon and let them work to feed the plant, you'll be using less fertilizer. And yes, nitrate uh, will result from the decomposition. So Tim, we've got a question here regarding um, biochar and um, the means of inoculating it with those uh, micronutrients before putting it in the soil. Uh -huh. uh, personally, I powder mine and I put it uh, in my compost teas um, and apply it uh, on top of the soil. So, you know, there's a lot of resources online about inoculating the biochar. So, so what does that mean? And how are some ways to do that? <laughs> um, I, you probably know as much as I do, but mycorrhiza is really big. It, it, it's a natural fit for biochar, moves right in. And if we can get the, it, it, it's really symbiotic in the, rhizosphere, it's, it's a key to um, feeding the plant exactly what it needs. So uh, I don't know, we have a number of people that know mushrooms and fungi around here, and we've been looking to work with them on setting up some inoculant um, and then kind of trying to cultivate local fungis. Um, but we're, we're still trying to make headway in that regard. Tim, we had a I, on that question too, Tim, so someone commented, um, does the biochar um, draw nutrients and microbes out of the soil first before giving it back if it's not inoculated was the question? Good question. Yeah, it can. And, it, it, and that's been one of the um, downsides in, in certain conditions it does. So again, add incrementally, um, add it in the fall if you can and let it overwinter and um, see what happens. 
Tim, we had someone um, wondering about uh, making biochar at home, um, asking whether or not it's totally necessary to dig a hole if they don't have a kiln, but wish, wish to create uh, biochar in their backyard, for instance. Um, and if so, um, how deep that would that hole need to be? Uh, six to 18 inches again. Um, we've done some burns right on top of the ground. It's, it's more tricky. Um, you'll end up with a lot more ash. And, um, you know, it, it's a matter of getting in there and getting the char to the side and dousing it while the rest of the fire keeps going. So it's, it's a lot of juggling, maybe more than it's worth. But Paul May has done a number of them right on top of the ground. But that's not ideal. Yeah. Could you uh, maybe comment a little bit about um, biochar and its relationship with groundwater and perhaps um, helping to protect groundwater? Excellent questions. Um, forget his first name, Zimmer, uh, ag consultant from Madison area that spoke at the small farm conference a couple of years ago. He said, one of the worst things we ever did was create water soluble nutrients because they go right through to the groundwater. And that's the beauty of carbon, uh, high carbon soil is that it maintains the nutrients and it actually cleans the water. It's, it's called an ecological service um, for the watershed. It, um, it filters all the stuff you don't want going down to the groundwater. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a great fit for, especially for here because of our sandy soils. If you're adding chemicals and watering and you're, you're not keeping tabs on that water, it, it's going right down to the groundwater. Okay. So it is eight o'clock and uh, I promised you that we would keep this to um, an hour. I would like to thank Kama and Tim so much for uh, joining us for uh, this um, evening. You know, it's something we, uh, we put together really quickly. Um, if you don't know, this week is National Biochar Week. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we had an event for that. We would have had a demonstration, a live demonstration uh, if we could, but because of COVID restrictions, we obviously we couldn't do it. Uh, so we decided to put this together and really quickly, Parker, Lauren and Michelle um, were instrumental in putting this slide, the presentation together and helping us run the program this evening. So, you know, I wanna thank you guys um, and also thank our participants. You know, I know biochar to us in this area is new but um, I like, you, you know, we talked about at the beginning, it's uh, something that has been around for thousands of years and that has gone to the wayside. But we are hoping to bring it back. Keep your ears open. We uh, want to keep the discussion going on this. We'll hold more events. Uh, we have your email addresses now and I promise you that we'll not sell them to anybody. <laughs> we, we will use it to communicate with you um, about biochar and things around it. So keep your eyes open. If you have any questions, you have our contact information here, feel free to reach out. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll talk again soon. One last thing, Kofi. Um, yes. I did put an exit survey in our chat. So if you could fill that out, that's a big help to us in planning future events. Um, it's just a really short anonymous survey and yeah, thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, and I will send the recording of this to you as well, you know, along with another link to the survey. So you have those two things um, as well. Again, thank you very much.